Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Facebook Live from Alzheimer's Orange County. My name is Melissa Clave. I'm the Director of Education here at Alzo C. And I'm joined this morning by Kim Bailey, one of our programs and education specialists. Hi, Kim. Good morning, Melissa. Good morning to our viewers. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, so this morning we're gonna be talking about meaningful activities at home and how we can help make those um, as meaningful as possible, how we can help engage our loved ones with cognitive changes. Um, we talk about some form of this on a monthly basis. Today we'll kind of throw a little bit of a different spin on it as always. So hopefully um, we welcome your questions and comments. We'd love to hear from you guys. Um, that's what makes these so fun. So please do um, write in the comment box anything, any questions or comments that you have. Um, before we dive in, I do want to thank our sponsor, again, Caring Companions at Home. They are uh, provided to, uh, committed to providing seniors with quality in-home care. They have personalized and affordable in-home care. Um, they have a, a four-step process. They um, have a, a care manager home visit to assess your loved one's needs. They have a detailed plan of care, a wonderful caregiver matching system to ensure the best fit and periodic visits to make sure your loved one's care is um, everything that you would want it to be. And so if you're interested in learning more, please visit caringcompaniansathome.com. They're a wonderful sponsor and we are so, so thankful for their sponsorship. We could not do these without them. Um, so good morning again, Kim, and um, let's dive in. Um, I want to start today off a little differently, um, sharing a quote um, by, of course, my my hero, Dr. Al Power. It's no surprise to anyone at this point that I'm quoting him on a, a weekly basis. Um, but I think this quote is just so important and something that hits me really hard. Um, so he says, uh, our societal view that people with cognitive changes cannot learn and grow, cannot care for others or give meaningful input and do not have a useful role in society blinds us to meaningful ways in which to engage them. Um, so this, of course, to me felt like a bit of a slap in the face, <laughs> but yeah. in a good way, uh, a wake up call, right? Um, I think he's saying that how we view people with cognitive changes really shapes what we do with them and for them. Um, he goes on to say that in order for us to have meaning and growth, we should set our sights on something higher than just just trying to maintain the status quo, we should really seek out for our loved ones what we seek for ourselves, which is meaning as we live out our days. Um, trying to explore useful roles and ways to engage um, them and because those deep human needs don't go away, right? The need to be needed, the need to feel useful. Um, and this isn't saying that we all have to be useful to, to have value, right? But it's saying that we need to recognize that our loved ones um, have the same desires and needs that we do, those don't go away. It's, it's more of a challenge for us to figure out how to fulfill those needs for them. Um, but you know, once we do that, I think we see really, really positive things happening. Um, so that's a pretty powerful quote. Um, and again, before we dive in even more, I wanna tell a story that I think really represents that. And this is a story that Dr. Power tells. Um, so I'll kind of retell it in my own words, but he tells a story about a woman named Ida who was a longtime resident of a, a home and she was a hundred years old. Um, and she was described, uh, which I'm sure she didn't appreciate, but by her unpleasant disposition. And she had frequent insulting comments toward those around her. Um, but the CEO of this nursing home was kind of on this culture change mission. He really wanted to see if he could kind of turn things around. And so he picked out Ida as kind of his special mission and he wanted to really see what he could do for her. So he asked her to name anything she wanted to do, anything in the world, and he would do his best to grant it. And so obviously you don't say something like this to someone without being ready to back it up. He said he was prepared to fly to Paris with her if that's what she wanted to do. Um, but she couldn't come up with anything. And so he gave her a little more time. And the next day she said, you know what, I'm too far gone. There's nothing, which is really sad to him. And so he kind of went to some colleagues and they said, you know, that, that might've been too big of a question. It might've been too open-ended. Why don't you try to narrow it down a bit? So he went back and he said, okay, Ida, what would you do if you had five minutes, anything you want for five minutes? And so she didn't hesitate this time. She said, I'd watch the sunrise. I'd drink a cup of my favorite tea in a Staffordshire China cup. And these they found out were cups that her mother had had and she had drank growing up. So they went out to buy these. They had to buy a set of eight, uh, but they found out that it was well worth it. Um, from then on, she woke at dawn she gazed out large windows at this beautiful field. She sipped her tea in her special teacup. 
And this was a ritual she hadn't been able to enjoy since she had moved in there. Um, and he, the CEO later observed that this simple pleasure was transformative for her and her disposition changed completely. She became a favorite of the staff. They were not only able to give her that joy, but they gave her this meaning through this ritual and, and autonomy over her day. Um, and it connected her to her past. And it was such a simple thing, just a cup of tea. Um, but, you know, they were able to provide this for her and they, they did have to ask <laughs> and they had to know these personal details about her. And he goes on to say, it's, it's really all about the details. Um, he didn't have to fly to Paris with her, uh, but, but because they homed in on these important details and they were able to make that happen, that completely transformed things for Ida. Um, and so we, we talk about this all the time, how important the little details are and what makes things meaningful isn't necessarily these grand gestures, but knowing the person intimately and knowing what they would enjoy and trying to work to find a way to make that happen and make these adaptations. A cup of coffee needs to be the kind the person likes, prepared the way they like it at the time they wanna drink it, right? So, right. so Kim, what else makes activities meaningful? Yeah, I'm just you know thinking about this transform this notion of transformative care and i think too going back to that first slide when we just attempt to care for people as they are in their illness we deny their history yes and i'd like to give an example of that um, and i i hope that our colleague then alan doesn't mind <laughs> but uh, Many of you have seen him teach uh, with Melissa as well in some of these sessions, and he tells very moving stories about his wife, Judy. And uh, I'm thinking about one of the times early on when Judy started living in a care community when I went over to visit, or maybe I went to teach a class or something, but I walked in and I watched an activity that was going on that Ben and his wife, Judy, were actually leading. Mm -hmm. And it was a Bible study. And so the truth is that that was a big part of who Ben and Judy always were. Their faith was a, the bedrock of, you know, their existence. And so this activity was something that was very meaningful for Judy throughout her life with Ben. It was part of her existence. And so when you think about that useful role in society and when you think about activities that people who are living with dementia need to be doing, they need to be doing things that map to their past and that have deep meaning for them. And so you can't just, you know, think about things like, well, let's do, you know, a ball toss today or let's play right. bingo today. You have to truly know the person who you're caring for. And of course, we, when you're a home caregiver, you have that advantage. But I know we have professionals online with us a lot of times in our classes. And so that person-centered care that we talk about, this is how that takes shape. It can only take shape by knowing the true origins of this person, of our the people we care for and knowing what has true meaning for them. So from Absolutely. a simple thing like drinking a favorite, a cup of tea and a favorite mug, to engaging in uh, activities that truly have meaning, deep meaning for people. This is what we need to be doing for our people who are living with dementia. Because I'll never forget the sight of the two of them mm -hmm. teaching, leading that Bible study. And it was, it was just beautiful. So yeah. thank you. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, just touching on other things here, as we mentioned, reflecting their likes, background, obviously, bringing a sense of comfort or purpose or feeling of belonging, all of those things fit into that story you just talked about, matching exactly. their abilities. So maybe that Bible study looked a little different than it had in past years, but nonetheless was really meaningful and meaningful, not just for them, but I'm sure for everyone else in that room as well. Um, it That's does take right. a little bit of work and we've got to challenge ourselves to think about how can we adapt this to whatever abilities that person has, um, but so important to, to figure Absolutely. out a way to do that. Um, so I thought this was, was really interesting and it really impactful for me. I think I've been guilty of this myself <clears throat> um, as many of the things we mentioned, but so, this says that many studies show that families and professionals consistently rate the quality of life of people with dementia lower than those people would rate themselves. Um, and so they found that the quality of life of a person with dementia was most correlated with their mood, but the quality of life when rated by a family member 
was correlated with that own family member's quality of life and their care burden. Um, so they're kind of unable to see outside of themselves to what their loved one might actually be experiencing. We tend to rate them as we think their experience is less than it really is. Um, and professionals also took into account their view of the person's degree of dependency in their rating. So if they thought the person was capable of less, they rated that person as having a less quality of life. And I think it's important wow. for us to know that we have these biases. We're gonna do it, there's kind of no way around that, but we need to recognize that and make sure that we're not taking the real disability that dementia has and adding to it by misrepresenting what somebody's actually feeling. We we're kind of we kind of compound, we layer disability on top of it by taking away, um, you know, that quality of life that that person might be experiencing and saying, well, they, they don't have a great quality of life anymore. So maybe I'm not going to worry so much about meaning or things like that. And I think I think our views really shape what we do and how we interact with our loved ones or or those in our care. Yeah, I think too. It's just a lot about expectations and you know since we're talking about activities today i think that maybe we place too much burden on ourselves in trying to come up with what we think are you know really hit it out of the park <laughs> we want to hit it out of the park every time we plan an activity and you know what what brings people joy and meaning doesn't have to be you know i always use the word fancy um, you know, sometimes just a simple uh, activity that you're doing, sitting on the couch with someone, uh, can just really represent an intimate moment where you're truly connecting. We always say, you know, it's the connection that we're seeking that really supersedes the actual task. So, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know, what the actual goal of the activity is. The, I mean, the, the goal is to really connect with the person right. and have that intimate moment and to have that closeness. And so, you know, when you're talking about measuring quality of life, I think, you know, we're really trying to measure those moments of connectedness. Yes. And that's really what we're after. That, Absolutely. That's really what we're after, just that sense of intimacy and feeling connected to that person. And so it doesn't always show up in, you know, a, a in the same way that we might expect it to. Yeah, I mean, that's such a good point. When I think about a meaningful activity I had this week, just myself, I mean, sitting with a friend on a park bench, you know, and just being together because it feels like that's so like, that's in short supply these days, being with, you know, our loved ones and just being able to kind of do that safely and um, that meant the world to me, you know? And so I, I think, you know, we don't, just like you said, it doesn't need to be fancy and being is is often so much more important than doing. Um, ties right in here. I, I still want to be needed in some way. I would like you to talk things over with me, even if I can't respond well. I still need to hear I need you, even when I can't believe you do. These are the words with somebody with dementia who wrote this book, um, you know, over 20 years ago. I think it's still completely relevant, holds true today. Um, these needs just don't go away. We want to you know, be connected in, in meaningful ways with our loved ones. I think that's really what it comes down to. Right. And so here's where, you know, just thinking of things, activities or tasks that you can do side by side. Uh, you know, I've told this story before about when I became a live-in caregiver mm -hmm. to my friend, how I sort of took over the kitchen and wanted to do for her you know, all yeah. these things. And I realized what a grave mistake I was making and sort of pushing her aside and wanting to make these perfect meals for her when really I was taking away the only job she ever had, uh, the main job she ever had, which was to run her household. And uh, once I realized my mistake and said, come on, you know, it's time for us to make dinner. And then, you know, relegated more tasks to her and we we're making things together and then cleaning up together side by side. And remember that feeling, you know, of satisfaction you get when the last dish is washed and you, you know, you put the dish towel, you know, to dry and, you know, you go, well, we got the kitchen all cleaned up. Yeah. We did a good job, didn't we? And just, you know, that feeling of satisfaction of a job well done. This is what's missing in yeah. people's lives who are living with dementia. 
that feeling of job well done. They're feeling like they're not productive anymore, like they're not needed. So let's bring mm -hmm. back that feeling of job well done. Okay. Absolutely. That's yeah. that's my, such a great point. Um, let's talk about when activities don't go so well and why that might be, why we see distress sometimes. We think, mm -hmm. okay, you know, they're doing something, um, but here we go. Many of the expressions displayed by people during activities, such as pacing, calling out, or even striking out, come as a reaction to the fact that the activity is devoid of meaning for them. Um, so again, this point that we're kind of trying to hit home here that um, it really needs to, they need to feel some connection to it. You know, busy work is not really the answer here. We need to figure out, um, you know, it can look like busy work to an outsider, but if somebody finds meaning in it, somebody finds meaning in folding towels or sorting things um, that we you know we might think from the outside, oh, that looks like just some distraction. Um, yeah. for, for some people that might be and, and isn't the right activity for them, but for others, they might find, you know, this is something they've done, kind of done their whole life. They were a homemaker. Um, so that's, you know, it's really all about what it means to that person, right? And this is where it's so hard, isn't it, yeah. Melissa? Because, um, you know, we have to sort of read their mind. Yeah or become detectives to try and parse out like which activities are appropriate and how are they going to react and so don't beat yourself up uh, on this point because we have to you know try different things and experiment um, the problem is is that we don't always know how they're going to react and so you know and the thing is they're not able to communicate with us and tell us you know oh this is this is too complex for me um, you know, or this is boring, or this is too overstimulating. And so when people aren't able to communicate with words, they communicate with behaviors. Right. And so we just have to be kind of tuned in and, you know, watch their reactions. And when you start to see things going south, we have to sort of pivot. <laughs> That's kind of a popular word yeah. now. Pivot and, you know, redirect and try something else. And so we can't all be experts. I mean, no one's an expert at this yes. because things change rapidly in, in this illness. So, you know, just kind of experiment, but always keep in mind that we want things to, as we've been saying all along, relate to that person in some way. They have to have some meaning to them and they have to be appropriate to their background, their, you know, their past, their likes, etc. So we, we just keep trying. And I know all of you are trying really hard. So I want to give you some kudos there. Yeah. Absolutely. I like mean, game. it's hard. Yeah. Stay at home has obviously made this whole situation just incredibly challenging without, you know, the normal supports yes. that people have, either adult day centers or or respite or loved ones, you know, just fan friends and family that might, you know, visit and kind of break up the monotony of just being yeah. at home. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a challenge and we can, yeah. can definitely And that's why we're here that. to give you some resources. Yeah, I've, or encouragement of nothing else. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so this was really an interesting thing to me. Um, I found recently a, a resource that I think is really wonderful and there's these guides, they're called By Us, For Us Guides. And they're written with in conjunction with care partners and people living with dementia. And so they all come together and write these guides. And you can find them by just Googling by us for us guides. I can put a link in the, in the comments as well. Um, but so this was a quote that I found in one of the guides. Um, and these guides are designed to help us kind of navigate dementia and how can we best serve our loved ones with uh, dementia. And, and we hear from people with dementia, which I think is a voice that's often not, we don't take in, always into consideration, which we really need to. Talking about experts, these are the experts, right? The people living it that can right. tell us what they're actually feeling. So this was a quote from one person with dementia who said, it's a challenge to find leisure activities that are meaningful yet not demeaning. And I don't know who this person is or where they were in their journey, but they felt like, you know, in their life, maybe that people trying to provide activities for them, um, you know, they weren't quite getting it right. It, it was a little bit, some of them maybe felt childlike or demeaning. Um, and I had a bit, I struggled with this quote a little bit when I read it because I love being silly. Um, I was silly all the time with my mom and we did lots of things that I think lots of people may consider to be childlike. But I think it's really important how we frame it and that person, my mom was a silly person. She loved to play jokes and be silly. Um, she was not a serious person by any means. And so, you know, I could tell that she was really enjoying things. And the way that we were doing these activities, it wasn't in such a way that I was treating her like a child. I was treating her the way that I always had. 
and just trying to kind of be silly with her. So I think it's really, you know, it's kind of a nuanced thing here when we talk about um, making sure that things aren't childlike. We can still, of course, be silly just as we always would, but I think we need to keep in mind that, you know, an activity might frame how we see someone and we don't want to see older adults as children. We don't want to take away a life that they've lived and experiences that they've lived, even as their mental abilities may be changing and becoming more childlike, they are not children, right? We need to respect them as the older adult with this, again, full life that they've lived. So I think it's really just an important point to think about. Anything you would add there? Yeah, that's really challenging because I'm kind of an overgrown kid myself. And yeah. So I know like when I lead, uh, we have a group uh, when we were meeting in person, we have a group called Our Gang. It's kind of a clubhouse. And I know that sometimes I'll take an approach in there and I'll say, come on, let's just be kids today. And, you know, we'll, we will act kind of goofy. Yeah. And so I think we just have to be sensitive and super alert to body language and reactions and you know just just see how people are taking it in so Absolutely. um yeah like you're I, i'm just gonna agree with what you're saying it's nuanced <laughs> i'll take that <laughs> it's very nuanced so yeah Absolutely. I think just being aware that that's, you know, a concern. Um, Absolutely. Because I would never want to offend anyone. And, cool. uh, you know, of course, over the years, I've worked with everything from rockets, everyone from a rocket science scientist <laughs> to, you know, Sunday school teachers yeah. to everything in between. And so, yeah. So for me, I wouldn't mind you treating me like a kid, you know, but lots of, you know, professors, et cetera. So just again, being mind, knowing the person, knowing their history and a little something about how they like to be treated, how they always wanted to be treated is sort of the key to these things. Absolutely. Yeah. So key. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of more advice here that I thought was really, I kind of pick and chose some of these from the by us for us guides that I was talking about earlier. Um, and so this is again, advice straight from people living with dementia. Um, they said things that were important to them that they want us to know. Um, ask me what is meaningful to me. Just like that CEO asked Ida, we don't necessarily need to assume that they don't know. Um, their communication might sound a little different. We might have to do a little detective work to figure out, you know, maybe what they're, they're saying. Um, we could ask, family members, friends, um, you know, if, if they're not able to tell us. Um, being observant, being really good observers, seeing how the activity makes them feel, just as you were mentioning, Kim, really being in tune with that. Um, they want their feelings and emotions validated, of course, don't we all? Um, but I think a lot of times with dementia, we see distress, um, behaviors like we talk about, and we think, oh, that's just you know, it's meaningless, it's purposeless, they're just doing that. And really we need to see that, all of that as communication. Right. Um, and, and how can we validate what that person's feeling? Is it fear? Is it sadness? Um, is it anxiety? And how can we make sure they un understand that we know that they're feeling that um, and then, you know, move forward with them together and figure out how can we turn this around? Um, yeah. Of course, including them in decision making and this may become challenging as dementia progresses, but even a simple choice between two choices. Or, yeah, uh, wherever we can. I think that's such an area that very quickly tends to be lessened. And I think that does create a lot of distress. That's what I saw with, with my mom and I've heard other people as well. Um, so figuring out how can we just give, you know, choices wherever possible. Um, and of course, adapting current activities. Um, anything you'd like to touch on here? Oh, yeah. that decision making. I mean, yeah. Just imagine as a grown adult, someone telling you, you know, it's time for you to go to bed now. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just telling you what to, telling you it's time to go to bed, you know, as opposed to what do you think? Are you getting tired or do you right. want to stay up for a while? Should we watch TV for a while? I mean, are you getting hungry? Would you like to eat? These aren't, you know, huge earth shattering decisions, but it's just bringing someone into their own letting them control a little bit yeah. um just simple things that way you know or simple things just simple choices is what i guess i'm trying to say yeah and just, i think it requires a mindset shift because mm -hmm. you know normally as we're going about our day we always talk about oh we're trying to get everything done trying to get these right. tasks done and so obviously with that giving someone a choice can take longer and you might not 
know what they're going to choose. <laughs> so that might right. change the course of things a little bit. Um, well, but, that's why you offer two choices that you know yeah. make sense right. in the scheme and, of things. <laughs> yeah, there can be a little bit of an art to it, right? Um, right. But this decision making makes me think sometimes of this tea kettle analogy that I really like when we say, oh, why is this person having just an outburst? You know, randomly, there's not nothing provoking it. And I think so, you know, you think about a tea kettle heating up over the course of, you know, many minutes and same thing with a person kind of heating up over the course of a day, heating up because their decisions are being taken away or they feel like, you know, their autonomy is, is shrinking and then all of a sudden that comes out, right. um, you know, and because it's been building and building and building. So anytime we can restore that, those choices, we can like lessen the heat and keep them, you know, content. Yeah, that's a perfect analogy. And, and then just, you know, validating yeah. In the course of that and being intuitive that that's happening and, you know, just assuaging people sometimes and just noticing that they're feeling fearful and giving them a hug or giving them Absolutely. some reassurance. So all of those things. I love that you found these guides, Melissa, yeah. and I'm, I'm <laughs> glad that we're making them available. Yeah, same here. I'll put a, I'll put a quote uh, or uh, a link in the comments. Good. Um, all right, I love the way you, you talk about how connection is more important. So I'd love for you to kind of talk about this. Oh, absolutely, especially now. My gosh, we're all so disconnected from the world and from one another. So, uh, you know, but in your homes, when you're caring for your loved ones, uh, just remember that everything you're doing is an activity, even personal care. Uh, and, and that, uh, as I said earlier, you know, the goal is not to accomplish the task so much as to make a, a connection while you're doing it. That connection is the task. Right. And just remember that no matter what, where they are on their journey uh, of the, with their progression, that people just never lose that desire to connect with you. In fact, it becomes stronger as the disease progresses. You are their anchor. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love the image here. Of, um, <laughs> yeah. Just look at her expression. <laughs> yeah. So I love that. I want picture. them to comb my hair. <laughs> yeah. That's a great activity, combing each other's hair. Yeah. So you want to talk about this as well? Sure. And, you know, this is, this is a concept that we sort of weave into a lot of our discussions mm -hmm. because uh, when we think about people living with dementia and we know that this is really a disease of emotions and that the emotions are really hard for them to control so you know there there's two enemies in dementia care and um, one is under stimulation and the other is over stimulation yeah. and so we're sort of always trying to achieve a balance and the way that what we're trying to you know, sort of come to is, is the state of balance and contented involvement where that person is sort of in a zone where they're involved in something that's meaningful and bringing them comfort, bringing them comfort. And so it could be just uh, something simple, a simple thing like looking at photo books, uh, sitting and having some of their favorite tea, like Melissa talked about earlier. They could be sitting on the patio in the garden, just looking around them. They could be holding a familiar object that has some deep meaning to them. Uh, look at the image you see there. Uh, music is just fabulous in any stage of the illness. Obviously, she's listening to music that has meaning to her, probably producing some wonderful memories. Uh, could be taking a walk, could be just sitting and holding hands. But that puts that person in the zone, in that comfortable place between over and under stimulation. So we don't want people bored. When they get bored, they start to get agitated. We don't want people overstimulated because then they get agitated. So, you know, we're sort of always trying to find that balance. And the answer is activities. And so that's why we're here today. And so if you can, do nothing else, just walk away today and just tell yourself, even if you just put these things on a post-it note, just come up with three or four 
things that can bring your loved one to a state of contented involvement. And again, as I say over and over again, it doesn't have to be anything, anything special or anything fancy, just something that can soothe them and bring them to that state. It'll be yeah. very helpful for you. That's a great point. Just having those ready to go instead of in the moment feeling go. stressed and like, oh my gosh, I need to think of something right now. <laughs> um, yeah. Having that list or and whatever you need, if you need yeah. supplies, um, just ready to go and then just make it, you know, easier on yourself. In um, a minute, we'll talk about a memory box and, yeah. you know, I mean, just have something ready to go and you see that agitation starting and you can just, you'll, yeah. you'll be prepared. Absolutely. Yeah. So daily routine activities, of course, we talk about just the things that we do every day and lots of things that we're doing around the house now all the time because we're at our houses all the time. Um, these can definitely be activities. We can stretch them out. We can kind of make them fun. Um, you know, chores, obviously, um, meal time that can be a whole, you know, few hours of cooking and prepping and setting the table and making it nice um, now that we have the time, you know, to do that. Um, this is a uh, personal care is one of my favorite ones. So this is a, a picture of my mom and myself. This is, I think in like 2014, maybe so quite some years ago. Um, and you know, I talk about this, uh, you know, when bathing became difficult, um, challenging, and we decided to kind of split up the bath and washing hair and kind of make it a salon day. And so we actually bought this like salon chair where it was easier for me to kind of wash her hair in the sink. Um, but I found that it was still kind of is a little straining on her neck. So I went out looking for like a neck pillow to use. And I found this one at Target, this like cat. And again, knowing my mom loves animals and she's silly, I thought, why not, you know, do this, it'll at least spice things up and make it kind of fun. And and um, it was one of the best purchases I made. It was probably like $5. And, um, you know, we just had fun with it. We took pictures like this all the time. And um, I'd put it on my head. She put it on her head. We'd kind of be silly and then, you know, kind of be able to do that activity um, and have fun with it. Um, was every day like this? No. Some days were hard. Some days were challenging, of course. But, um, you know, when I kind of changed my perspective on what that activity was and could be, um, time for us to be together rather than just something to do and just get it done. It really, really changed um, that. And these are some of my favorite, you know, moments and memories now that I have with her just being able to, you know, be together in that way. So I special. love that picture of you. <laughs> Thank That's you. fabulous. <laughs> I used to um, get my friend ready and spend hours, you know, with the shower. I was so lucky because she actually enjoyed showering, which is kind of unheard of in dementia yeah. care. But I do her hair and makeup and get we get dressed in some of her favorite outfits and spend hours doing it. And then I take pictures of her and uh, videos and send it to her kids who lived up in Northern California. And I mean, it was just do her nails. Yeah. We weren't going anywhere, but it didn't matter. Right. No. I mean, it felt good and you know, she enjoyed it. Um, and sometimes we went places, but you know, yeah. but it was, it, the joy was in the process, you know, it, it just, uh, and it, it filled her day with meaning Absolutely. and uh, your day got filled with silliness, which I love. Yeah. And that we yeah. laugh any chance we got. Definitely. Um, wonderful. Yeah. So, you know, we talk about using your senses a lot, um, especially as dementia progresses and, and sensory things become so much more important. And I think it's important to think about, you know, what, how can we engage all, all of the senses of this person? And, um, you know, as the, the language and the words become less, our senses just become almost heightened. So would you, would you, you want to go through some of these? Sure. Uh, yeah. Appealing to all the senses, particularly in later stages, I think is a great idea with sound, you know, using music, uh, not only their favorite music, like on an iPod, uh, but you can use uh, recordings off the internet of nature. Um, you can do some th fun things with um, musical uh, instruments, especially uh, beat, uh, drums, drum yeah. circles, all kinds of fun things like that. You can read aloud. Don't worry about comprehension because they really just enjoy the sound of your voice. Yeah. Uh, with sight, you can use photos over and over again. Um, I have a big binder that has laminated pictures mm -hmm. of nature and animals. Animals are always a hit. 
Um, you can also use animal videos. Uh, you can do bird watching either out in the garden or walking around the neighborhood or just sitting by the window. Uh, there's lots on the internet now, virtual uh, oh, yeah. museum tours. There's, you can go visit all the um, aquariums online. There's just, you can, uh, you can go around the world uh, and just see all kinds of things online. Smell and taste, fresh flowers. Uh, you can, if the person, unless they're sensitive to uh, diffusers, essential oils, fragrant lotions, those are all, I think, really indicated. Baking to fill the house. You can, it's a great activity to do together yeah. side by side. And then you fill the house with a wonderful aroma, which you cannot help but feel good about. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just brings those sensory memories are just incredible. Bake bread or bake cookies and then tactile experiences, um, especially if you have animals, if you pet something furry, that's always nice. Uh, or you can sculpt or finger paint, uh, feel fabrics. All of those, all of those things are are great. Yeah. One thing we did because my mom was always really into gardening and flowers, mm -hmm. and I um, found this like flower press that I'd had. I mean, it's really just cardboard, you know. And so I started pressing some flowers from outside, and I made her a book of them. And that was one. Of, and she would kind of point out and you know, tell me the names of them. And yep. um, it's okay if we didn't know the names, we'd make up silly names or whatever it was, but it was just such a cool thing that she, you know, she just loved flowers. And so that was a nice way that we could kind of do that inside, um, you know, if we aren't walking out in the garden. So I loved, I just remembering that. <laughs> thought about wonderful that things you do yeah. with your mother what you've <laughs> done in the past and yeah, beautiful things, Melissa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and repetition is good. We included these things just because, uh, and I want to mention too that uh, it's a it's a myth that people living with dementia can't do things, can't yeah. initiate things. They do have trouble getting started, mm -hmm. and we can help. Uh, a lot of times, they just need to be prompted, or uh, we can demo things, do things side by side. We can be, we can, you know, just get them started they've kind of lost their initiative sometimes but once they get going they can follow through and do and here you know of course i'm talking about people a little bit further along yeah. they can get once you get them going they can repeat they have a repetitive the repetitive yeah. motion is is intact so sweeping raking uh, stringing beads, blowing bubbles, folding is soothing, it feels therapeutic, uh, cutting pictures out, making collages, uh, polishing silver, uh, silverware for, for a woman maybe would be something, sorting things for a man. Mm -hmm. um, I might be being sexist here, maybe, maybe. I mean, there's this. It's just a stereotype for reason. <laughs> Call me crushing here. here. <laughs> it's all it just, you know, depends on your person. You know your person and what they might do. And anything tasks that map back to what they used to do for a living, uh, if there's something that you can weave in in that way is good too. But jobs jobs and activities with repetition are good. Absolutely. And you had mentioned the activity box or memory box. Right. I mean, it could be a basket or a trunk, you know, but just load something up with kind of, you know, I have a little basket here, but oh, great. I mean, you could have, um, you know, just, just some kind of container that has things ready to go. And it, I mean, I think I have, um, like a little photo album in here with photos that they can sit and look through. I mean, when you're a caregiver, you you've got so many challenges. You have so yeah. much to do. So this could be right by my recliner. <laughs> I could mm -hmm. be engaged in things while you're in the kitchen or doing other things outside. You know, this is a my little journal that I read and write in. Um, you know, maybe there's some colored pencils mm -hmm. and some sketch and a sketch pad, um, bubbles. You know. It's it just it's it's very person centered. These are some cards with some. Mm -hmm. I've got stickers. I've got greeting cards from the past. 
maybe to stimulate some memories. I made a whole box for the lady I cared for and it had her wedding announcement in it. I found her original wedding announcement. I had a little spiral bound notebook that she had that was a diary of um, some of the road trips that she took with her husband. You know, things with meaning uh, that can occupy, can Absolutely. occupy her. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a good, this is a good thing that can keep people occupied, um, especially around sundowning time. Yeah. You know, that period late in the day when people start to get restless and they're a little bit tired and starting to get a little cranky maybe or agitated. Um, they need meaningful activities at that time to soothe them. So. Yeah, I think this is something too that um, I mean, maybe not so much now with physical distancing and but if you had someone coming over to your house um, who doesn't quite know what to do with that person or how to be with them, you know, a relative or a friend they don't see often. We, we struggled with this a lot. You know, they kind of was like felt awkward and didn't know what to do. But if you have something like this that the two of them yep. or whoever can look through together and just Yep. you know, make small talk and reminisce. Um, I think that's such an easy kind of ready-made activity for someone to just kind of come in and do right. And again, give someone a break if they need it, um, you know, the primary care partner or whatever it is. So I think this is a, a nice kind of ready-made thing that right. they can engage art. in with other people. Or they can paint together, memories in the yes. making art. Absolutely. Yeah, they can make some art together. Yeah, and I, I've shown this before, but um, this is my niece. <laughs> um, but they, they've this. been making uh, little, you know, things on their windows and doors to thank UPS and mail and Amazon and all those essential workers out there just working so hard to bring us all our stuff. Um, so, and you know, they just they change this up every once in a while, but just really fun. Or writing a thank you card, or writing just a card in general, bring back the the snail mail. Um, uh, so, you know just simple things that we can do. And, and it really makes a difference to the person receiving it too. It's such a feel good thing. And it makes you know us feel like we're doing our part to say thank you. I love that you put this slide in because, you know, most people have had um, some volunteering in their background. Yeah. And many people, you know, used to be social workers or a lot of them were essential workers or whatever themselves. And so having some type of a service project for people who are living with dementia is a great idea and it really makes them feel useful. So if you're at home caring for someone, you can, as you said, Melissa, do some cards for even the mailman. Yeah. And then watch, watch them when they open it, go to the door and watch and see how, you know, they react. And I mean, this is a great, Great idea. I'm just yeah. really glad you included this. Yeah, absolutely. Something we can all do. <laughs> um, so as you mentioned, there's tons of virtual stuff now more and more every day. It seems like um, those natural or the live, you know, cams of animals and the aquarium. Um, there's also tons of websites that do free classes. Um, all these are for older adults, I believe. I don't know how they check if you're an older adult. I'm sure anyone can get away with it. Um, but Covia, right. Uh, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> Covia is one. You could just Google like Covia is well connected. Senior Planet um, or Senior Resource Recreation. And I've poked around these websites. They all. I haven't taken any of the classes as a disclaimer, but they have tons of. They're either like fitness or just interesting, like history or just a kind of a coffee chat for people to get together. So the, it seems like there's really something for everyone. They seem to offer some in different languages as well. Um, so there is stuff out there. You know, obviously there's tons of YouTube videos as well, but it's kind of nice to be a part of something that's live and ongoing. Um, we have, you know, our classes as well, of course. We have some activities. Do you want to talk about any of our activities that we have, Kim? Sure. Well, we do have some. Um some things on our website that you can click on. We have activities on our website, but we also have a wonderful program for people caring at home uh, called Connect a Culture. And so the program is designed for the individual who's living with memory loss and their care partner to participate together. And we conduct the activities over Zoom and we have them usually once a week, uh, generally on a Thursday. And we have a lot of fun. We used yeah. to go out to the community and do things, you know, at Bowers Museum. And we'd go uh, do outings like in parks and, uh, you know, 
outdoor activities, but now we're all virtual, but we're still having a lot of fun. And so if you're interested and would like to do art with us or listen to music online, we have live concerts that we stream, et cetera, uh, please contact us here at Alzheimer's Orange County. And uh, I'd love to talk to you about the program, Connect yeah. to Culture. And we'll put our helpline up at the end as we always do. Um, so that you can get in touch with us. Um, just kind of to wrap things up, we know that the approach is so important. Not only does the activity needs to have some meaning, some connection, something for the person to kind of you know connect with, but also the way that we invite someone can matter as well. Instead of like you had mentioned, Kim, oh, it's time to go to bed. It's time to do this. Um, you know that can feel like okay. You know now my days are kind of being structured for me. I don't feel like I have much choice. Right. Um, but you know, and it matters to us too the way that someone invites. Uh, me to do something kind of can make a difference in, in my inclination to want to do it as well. Um, you know, saying, would you join me in the dining room for dinner tonight? You know, instead of it's time to eat, um, go, you know, sit down. Um, or I could really use your help. That was a big one for me. Whenever I asked for help, again, that need to be needed. Um, my mom rarely would say no. <laughs> um, she'd almost always, you know, do whatever it was uh, with me. Um, thank you goes a long way as well as I'm sorry. So all these really important words. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing is, it's kind of hard sometimes when you ask someone who's living with dementia, do you want to, and then fill in the blank, the answer yeah. is automatically no. Yeah. You know, a lot of times just because of the fear factor. So, you know, when it comes to an activity, it's almost like you want to, you want to, you want to ask them to join you. It, it's you want like, to advertise it. Like, this, but, I'm doing yeah, this thing that's really fun. Like, <laughs> where I, you know, I have, there's a, there's a guy, a colleague named David Troxel, and yeah. he has an approach called the best friends approach. Yes. And so he'll say, instead of saying, okay, we're going to sing now, go over there. <laughs> you know? right. I'll say, come on, we're going to, it's time to sing. I can't wait. Come with me. So it's like enjoining someone. You're asking them to join with you instead of just directing people. So I think that makes a big approach when, or it make a, makes a big difference when you approach something like, you're doing it together as as best friends rather than you yeah. know directing someone. I think it so. sets the stage for the whole activity, yeah. which is you know we can't stress that enough. Um, and I, I want to end with this quote here, um, really impactful to me. Uh, rather than being people simply in need of our care, people who forget can teach us about life and living and offer us an opportunity to go deeper into our souls. I've found this to be true in my personal life. Um, you know, I think caregiving has so many challenges. Um, it really is a roller coaster. I've been very fortunate to have, you know, a big support network with friends and family. And we have, you know, plenty of resources. I've had Alzheimer's Orange County have my back for the last, you know, six years or more. Um, we know that everyone comes from different backgrounds and has different resources and, and has different challenges. Um, but we all, you know, love our loved ones with dementia. And I think it's important to understand and, and kind of have this perspective that, you know, they are teaching me something about life. They are helping me slow down. You know, we are being in the present moment together more than, than we had before. Um, so that to me was always really impactful. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, and we have a few other things that are coming up. We have a cup, we have three series coming up next month. Next month's the busy month for us. So we have our Savvy Caregiver Series, which we're doing monthly now. This is for our care partners um, who are caring someone for someone with dementia. And it's a three-week series. It's two hours a week. Um, this used to be a longer series, but it's been condensed. And it's just a wonderful program, evidence-based. It's a, actually a nationally acclaimed program that we offer. And so we really encourage you to, to contact us about that. Um, Kim, do you want to talk a little bit about living well with memory loss? Sure. So, so we're savvy caregivers is for caregivers only and really caregivers who are uh, taking care of someone who's moderately to more severely impacted by the disease. Living well with early memory loss is for individuals who have just received, pretty much just received the diagnosis of dementia and uh, would like to join with their primary caregiver or 
well, and it's not, they're not even a caregiver at that point, either their partner, spouse yeah. or a partner, a significant other. So the two of them come to the living well with early memory loss, just to talk about what it means to receive a diagnosis, to look at the journey ahead, to uh, talk about how to live well with this diagnosis, uh, discuss some healthy living uh, strategies, coping techniques, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a great program. Yeah. And so great we encourage program. you, if you, if you yourself or if you know anyone in that situation, please share that information with them. Um, lastly, we have a, a series which I'm really excited about. We're offering for the first time virtually. It's called Four Weeks to a Better Memory. It's led by our memory programs coordinator, Aroxy. She's amazing. Um, this course will kind of take you through some brain health and some really fun memory teasers and tricks. Um, and just ways to practice, um, you know, enhancing your memory. And it's really all about practice. It's all about paying attention. And um, I learned a lot from this course and I, I hope you guys can uh, join us. You do need to go to our website to sign up. Um, and lastly, our walk is coming up. Obviously it's virtual this year, but that doesn't mean it's le any less fun. You can walk or run wherever you are. Um, please either join a team. We have teams. I have a team. Kim has a team. You can join our teams or you can make your own with your friends and family. Um, it's really easy to go and sign up. I'll actually put the link in the comments and we would love to see you there. Um, I'm sure there'll be sharing of pictures and videos and some sort of a, a program the day of. Um, but it's, it's one of the big ways that we help support our organization and, and provide things like these classes and our programs. Um, and so we would encourage you to, to join our community in, in that walk uh, in November. Yeah. And Kim's a big fundraiser. So, you know, she's hard to beat, oh. but. Oh, boy. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> well, uh, well uh, thank you all again for being with us. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Caring Companions yeah. at Home. Uh, any last words, Kim? I just was going to thank you for inviting me uh, to be on the program this morning. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed being with you, and this uh, topic is close to my heart. And uh, I just uh, really want to thank our viewers who are out there doing this tough job at caregiving, so yeah. challenging under normal conditions, and even made made even more so, more challenging by. Uh, the COVID pandemic. So thanks to everyone who's uh, yes. tuned in and doing such a great job. And thank yes, you, Melissa. And, oh, my pleasure. You're always welcome. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone. That's I see the same faces kind of week after week, which I'm so thankful that you guys find um, this, you know, valuable and that you're willing to spend, you know, some time in your morning with us. It means a lot to us. Um, and next month, Kim and I are going to be talking about um, how to the, the importance of meal times, how to improve the experience of meal times. So we have tons of, of um, you know, practical things that we can do, and we would encourage you to join us for that next month. Um, yep. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.